Dr. Bob Godfrey, good to have you back on the program today. Great to be here. I, you know, I was so misbehaved last time. I didn't think you'd have me back. So I'm, I'm glad you're giving me a second chance. So much controversy. Yes, so yes. Controversy. I hope it'll be a second blessing. <laughs> well, um, we thought we would have you on today and talk about the book of Revelation. You just had published through Ligonier uh, a little booklet on on the book of Revelation, a book on the, on, of, on the book of Revelation. Well, I did I did a recorded teaching series, an audio uh, audiovisual teaching series that's available through Ligonier, and I think they have a little booklet that right. accompanies, but yeah, right. I did. Yeah, well, we thought we'd have you on today to uh, to solve all the riddles of the book. Of Absolutely, Revelation. I solved it all. Um, <laughs> It it has a kind of interesting story because the the series I did for Ligonier was really born here in the church yeah. in in the adult Sunday school class and there was a, a a dear saint in our church Cindy Cluey who has gone to be with the Lord yeah. who for years came to me and said won't you teach the book of the Revelation and I had avoided it for years. All I thought about the book of the Revelation is it's nothing but controversy and difficulty <laughs> and obscurity. <laughs> I don't have the time or the wisdom to take it on. But finally, I gave in, and I so thoroughly enjoyed that study and found it so much more spiritually profitable than I had anticipated. So, right, right. Yeah, it's... um. I, I, I've preached through the book of Revelation now and really enjoyed. I, I had a great experience doing that. Um, surprisingly, I don't know that I did it well, but I, I at least had a good good experience. I don't know how the congregation felt. <laughs> I think they enjoyed it and appreciated it. Yeah. I, you know, I think there are, um, you know, people in the pew say it's a book in the Bible. We ought to read it and understand it. And then ministers look at it and say, it'd be great to understand it, but do we? And uh, um, uh, but I, I, I really do think it's very spiritually profitable. I noticed in the, the time of the Reformation, um, th- there aren't a lot of commentaries on the book. I know Bullinger wrote one on Revelation. I, I do have it. It'd be interesting to look at how he approached it. But um, I, uh, Calvin didn't write a commentary on Revelation. No, I did read somewhere that there was a close associate of Calvin's who wrote a commentary on Revelation that Calvin liked. Oh, but I've never followed up on that. I don't know if that's and who it is. No, I can't remember who it was. Okay. Uh, yeah. Why? Why has it not been? Maybe this is a good question to begin with. Why has it not been treated? And, and maybe it has at some periods. But why has it not been treated in reform circles as much as? Well, this is this is kind of an easy hand me to, but dispensational ones. <laughs> well, I I think there were a number of commentaries written in the 17th century right. by reform people. Yeah. Um, I think the problem is it is conf- can, can be confusing, and I think um, with the the change of mood in American Christianity, British Christianity, mm-hmm. in the late nineteenth, early twentieth century, from the prevailing post millennial optimism mm-hmm. to uh, an, a, an ever growing pre millennial pessimism about what's actually going on in contemporary history. That <clears throat> led people back to Revelation and um, to the themes of judgment there and um, the themes that perhaps this is describing what's going to happen at the end of history mm-hmm. and uh, uh, therefore to prepare us for that. And I think <clears throat> that points us back to the fact that how you approach the book of Revelation, what you expect to find in the book of the Revelation is critical to how you actually interpret it. Right, right. And that leads me to <clears throat> my questions <laughs> that I have prepared for you. Um, so what is the book of Revelation attempting to accomplish? Um, I think, you know, everyone sort of comes at this book, to this book, with presuppositions in light of your own eschatology, which can make it challenging to let it speak on its own terms. But <laughs> Right. <clears throat> and that's why my study is so important, because I was— Perfectly objective, clean slate, <laughs> n- uh, no assumptions as I went into it, um, which of course is not true. None of us do that. But um, what what did quickly come through to me was this sense that uh, this book is meant to be encouraging. Mm-hmm. Anyone who reads this book right. aloud will receive a blessing, the book right. says. So <clears throat> how is it meant to be a blessing? Is it meant to say, um, 
uh, don't think so much about now, but think about the distant future because the distant future is going to be good. That could be a kind of blessing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the, the book of the Revelation does much more than that. And I think it makes clear uh, that it does much more than that by in the very first chapter saying these things will happen soon. Mm -hmm. Well, that immediately challenges us to uh, realize this is not meant just for some far distant future, mm -hmm. but it's going to, the importance of the soon there is to say what's being said here is a blessing to us now, not just um, debatable information about the future. Right. I think that's, I think that's really helpful. It, and, and you have the airs of falling into a sort of preterist view of reading it, that it's only for pre, you know, AD 70 era. Right. right. I mean, you can read too much into the soon. So the mm -hmm. soon is absolutely everything that's predicted here will happen, <clears throat> excuse me, or has happened already in the first century. But then that doesn't really make the book much of a blessing either, mm -hmm. because Right. Now, for us, it's all in the remote past, just as the uh, more premillennial reading tends to put it all in the remote future. So um, neither of those, I think, capture the spirit of the book, which mm -hmm. is a book of present blessing uh, mm -hmm. for Christians who read it. What, what if you were to sort of summarize the main thesis of the book or the main goal of the book? What is, what is being done through John in that book? Well, I think what John is doing is um, getting Christians to think about how they live in a time of suffering mm -hmm. and how that time of suffering will eventually be brought to an end by Christ's return and judgment on the wicked. So um, it's a very realistic book that way. It is not a book that anticipates Christians are going to have it easy in this world. But uh, it helps us to to face the suffering of this world and to face it with faith and hope and courage and um, uh, perseverance. Yeah. Um, that first vision is so, I think, crucial to the sort of, sort of trajectory of the book, <clears throat> that showing Christ is walking among his lampstands. <laughs> He's risen. It's the only image we have of Jesus in the Bible, by that, the way. Yes, um, yes. And... Uh, it's all symbolic. <laughs> That's right. And his face shines like the sun, which you can't really paint. So uh, You cannot paint it. Yeah. Um, so when people say, you know, we can make images of the Lord, um, that's the only one you get. <laughs> That's right. <clears throat> That's right. And um, yeah. But it's a central vision, I think, especially to, at least as I've seen it, he's encouraging his churches. He's saying, I'm walking among you. And he's he seems to be concerned about the fidelity of the church's mission and witness in this age right. in light of the sufferings, John being a sort of illustrative of that on Patmos himself, um, banished yeah. there to a Roman <clears throat> penal settlement, right? Exactly. Exactly. And he's walking amongst the church in his resurrection glory, in his divine glory. I mean, he's not um, walking amongst the church as someone who's wringing his hands and wishes he could help, but can't. He's walking uh, among the 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 lampstands to signal he's in charge he's he's bringing this about he's accomplishing his purpose and the churches mustn't lose heart uh, and you know i think it's important to always bear in mind that these churches were probably most of them very small mm -hmm. struggling and um to think that the creator sovereign lord of the whole world and of all history um is moving history for their sake is a wonderful blessing to contemplate. This is what's always troubled me about, I, I'm jumping ahead, but I'm good at that. Amillennialism always being characterized as pessimistic. <laughs> you know, it seems to me that when you say, and, and that was my experience preaching through it, it, it's such a, yes, it paints a dark picture of this world. It paints a, a a struggle with the principalities and powers in this world and the, the things that are happening. But it's optimistic in the sense that Jesus is reigning and has declared the victory. Right. You know, I, I, it, it's always interesting to think about what John reflected back on Jesus' earthly ministry uh, for when he's writing either his letters or this revelation. And um, I'm, I'm always intrigued by uh, Jesus' statement uh, at the end of John 
um, 16, where Jesus facing the cross the right. next day right. says, I have overcome the world. Yeah. Be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And that verse could even be translated, I've conquered the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, when I'm lifted up, will draw all men to me. Um, in, earlier in John. Um, but that that sense that the suffering is the victory, um, mm-hmm. at least part of the victory, is uh, what's what's being opened up for us, I think, in the book of the Revelation. It's hard, it's hard to accept. <laughs> it is, yeah. It, it, <laughs> glory is good. Suffering is a bummer. Right. Um, and uh, um, But that's what Jesus has told us over and mm-hmm. over again uh, to expect in this world. Right. Um, and I think, you know, when you think of the eschatologies that come into this, you know, sort of post-millennialism looks for this golden age where through the preaching of the gospel, we're going to see mass conversion to Christ. And that's the optimism that they seem to be looking for before the coming of Christ. I I don't see that in the book of Revelation. I see exactly what you just said. (laughs) I see, I see suffering precedes the glory that everyone's looking for, but I think it's an important message that that suffering is not a defeatist kind of thing. Um, this is triumphant. Right. Right. Absolutely. And um, yeah, you know, the whole of uh, controversies about Revelation chapter 20, here you have a handful of verses mm-hmm. in the whole Bible talking about a millennium, and that handful of verses, and the interpreters usually miss the most important thing about those verses. We can leave that hanging for <laughs> <laughs> the viewers. Um, but the most important thing about that, those verses is usually ignored. And in, instead, so much of redemptive history is is poured into that very brief time. The post-millennialists say we're moving to this glorious millennium that's going to be just a fabulous time, but the book of the Revelation gives it five verses or something. Yeah, and, right. Um, right. The, I mean, it's sort of the same for premillennialism. So in terms of the sort of um, us versus them issue in the book. I mean, I've, I've read it. We've talked about this a little bit. It does have this feel. It's so us versus them uh, and the antithesis so strong in the book. Um, that doesn't always seem to, you know, we live, we live in interesting times in America. Um, we see a shifting culture, a changing culture. But it doesn't, when we read Revelation, we see the us versus them. How are we to understand that in light of our experience in the governments of this world and how we live as Christians in the world in light of the opposition? I guess my question is, is maybe it's because all these discussions on Christian nationalism are so fresh in my head. Is the state always in its worst form? Is the, is the world always in its worst form and assaulting us? Um, is that how we're to read the book of Revelation? What are we to, does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a great way of putting it. Is the book of the Revelation saying the world is always in its worst form? And I think the answer is no. But I think the book of the Revelation is saying the world is always opposed to us. Mm-hmm. And that opposition right. may take different forms. Um, uh, God has a restraining grace that holds back. Mm-hmm. Um, often in history, the state from becoming the worst it can be. Right. Um, so, um, the, you know, I, and, and we always have to bear in mind that no one book of the Bible tells us everything the Bible wants to tell us. So we have to see the book of the Revelation in relation to other books as well. W- one of the things that struck me is there's almost no call to evangelism in the book of the Revelation. It's sort of like everybody has taken sides, and the two sides are at war, mm-hmm. and that's just the way it is. Uh, there may be one or two verses that can sound slightly evangelistic. And maybe in the, the churches, right? Some of the yeah, the, right, and um, addressed to the church. But but basically, as you said, this is a we <laughs> they book, and um, it, it's because it is written, I think, in a time when a lot of churches were experiencing real and sometimes quite severe persecution, and so it's intended to to help the churches in those times to survive, to persevere. And uh, we, have, we have plenty of encouragement to evangelism elsewhere, and we mustn't forget that. That's very important. But um, I think the book of the Revelation as a whole has a different purpose, and that's to encourage uh, Christians to endure. 
But also, don't you think, especially with the churches, to also, it seems to me Jesus is very concerned about compromise in the church throughout this age um, because of the persecution, because of the struggle, because of the opposition. And don't we see this constantly today, that the church ends up compromising its mission and its message. And Jesus, those, those are known as covenant lawsuits at the beginning, <laughs> yes. right? Yes. He's, he's giving some very serious warnings to the church to... Right stay the course in who they are and be faithful unto death seems mm-hmm. to be the message. Mm-hmm. Well, and and the other thing that runs through the book of the Revelation is that those who dwell on the wor- on the earth in the book of the Revelation are always the wicked who are opposed to Christ. And Christians are always described as those who dwell in heaven. Mm. And so our our essential citizenship, our essential identity, is being challenged by the by the book of the Revelation, and the book of the Revelation never encourages the strategy uh, of some Christians that says, "I will be more acceptable, I will be more successful mm-hmm. if I have one foot in the world and one foot in heaven." Right. Um, that is not a strategy that Jesus encourages. In in fact, I think condemns here. Uh, very clearly in the book of the Revelation. You need to be all in for him. You need to be all in for what he's taught, what he's doing, what he's accomplishing. And um, I, I think that's a very important message for our time. Mm-hmm. Especially that, that following the churches in chapter four, when he, he, you know, he sees a door opened in heaven and he sees the throne. <laughs> there's the boardroom, right? right, there's, right. there's where the decisions are being made. And, <clears throat> exactly. And we belong there. Yeah. Um, he'll go on to say. Yeah. And that, you know, the temple of the first chapter is seen more broadly in, in the fourth and fifth chapters. So it's not that we see two different rooms. We're, we're getting a deeper mm-hmm. entry into the glories of the heavenly uh, reality <clears throat> in chapters four and five. Right, right. Um, so um, in terms of the Everyone says we've come into this time of distress as Christians right now, trying to find our way through this. How does how does the Christian in this age, how does the book of Revelation help us in our particular, in, in view of our moment where it seems to me, you know, we, we've talked about the end of Christendom. It seems to me Christians are very much on edge right now um, in light of cultural change and shift. And um, how does how does this how does this book help us through that? Well, you know, in in order to try to <clears throat> ensure you'll never invite me back, uh, <laughs> yeah, I always try. <laughs> l- let me say it, it strikes me that an awful lot of Christians in our time are whiners. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not enduring any significant persecution <laughs> whatsoever in America. <laughs> actual, now, actual persecution. Actual persecution. Yeah. Um, you know, look at the poor Jews on in major college campuses in this country. You can't walk across the campus with a yarmulke on without fearing real physical attack. Yeah, I I hardly know a Christian anywhere who who w- walks across a campus who's fearing that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, now, if you're a Christian professor, you may get difficulty in being hired or promoted. I mean, there there are, I'm not saying there's no persecution in this country, but really, Christians are very free to go to church, to publish yeah. books, to go to conferences, to say what they want to say. We're complaining about overregulation of things like, well, Doug Wilson was on Tucker Carlson the other day, he was talking about the size of nails and the sheetrock and, and yeah. you know, tags on the mattress. Come on. <laughs> yeah, this, the, the, this is not huge persecution of Christians. <clears throat> and and w- what this really points to <clears throat> is w- Christians are calling persecution what, what is really the loss of their privilege. Mm-hmm. Um, That's exactly cultural right. privilege. That's exactly right. And I can understand why people resent losing cultural privilege, but we we mustn't confuse that with um, being persecuted for faithfulness to the Lord Himself. Th- those are quite different things. I, I probably told you I had a fascinating conversation with Carl Truman about some of these things, and uh, he's become friendly with a cardinal in the Roman Catholic Church. And he said to this cardinal, our Protestant churches 
are full of angry people. Maybe I already said this on your show, but it's it's worth repeating, and I'm old. Um, and and Carl said to the cardinal, are your Roman Catholic churches full of angry people? And the cardinal's response was a big smile <laughs> and saying, no, because we never thought this country belonged to us. Oh, that's such a fascinating statement. I think that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're angry because we thought this country belonged to us, and now they're saying it doesn't belong to us. It belongs to someone else. I understand that sense of disestablishment. It's disorienting. Uh, it's frustrating. Mm -hmm. It it means I have to adjust to a world I don't understand and don't like, Um, and, and therefore I can understand it leads people to be angry. But Jesus never says we're supposed to be angry right. um, uh, in communicating to the world. His call is always that we be gentle and kind and loving in communicating to the mm-hmm. world. And so I would say to all our listeners, if if you're spending a lot of time being angry, maybe you really need to do a spiritual inventory and ask, what are you angry about? And is this honoring to the Lord? Or, or do we really need to try? I mean, I can get angry if I think about yeah. You know, certain right. things that have happened in this in this society. But what we really need is to is to offer an alternative mm-hmm. um that's attractive and most importantly faithful to our Lord and his style of ministry. Right. Um I was I I think it's in Jude I was reading the other day that when the Lord comes in blazing glory, you know, it's the grumbers and complainers that are mentioned in the judgment. Yeah. And um the, the the whole you know, I'm I'm preaching through the Sermon on the Mount right now. I'm just taken by Jesus's whole approach to the hatred of the world. You know, mm-hmm. we're tough. We're ready to take them on. We're gonna. I see this. I hear this language all the time. We need to fight. We need to fight. And Jesus is telling us when it comes to hatred for who you are as a Christian, turn the other cheek. You know, yeah. Do not resist one who's evil. I. I have a hard time with it. Right, right. <laughs> it's shocking. Right. But the character of the Christian, light of the Beatitudes, um, is something that matters a lot to Christ of us in this present age because, well, we look like yeah. him. Well, and I, I thought you made a great point in the sermon that, um, you know, doesn't happen very often, but this was a great point. <laughs> yeah. They, they are very frequent, very rare. And when they come, Bob writes them down. So. Yeah. yeah, I've got a, you know, three by five card. And... Uh, <laughs> We actually like each other. So, um, no, but the great point was so often we spend most of our time looking at the Sermon on the Mount trying to say what it doesn't mean Mm -hmm. so that we can avoid the sharpness of the challenge to the way we think and live. And I think Jesus' whole point is that he wants to be sharp and challenging. Now, this may, uh, you know, as I'm sitting here thinking, I do try to think as well as talk. Uh, uh, the listener may be saying, well, is Jesus being gentle and loving in this communication? Well, he's certainly being loving. Jesus isn't always gentle in his communication, Mm -hmm. but he's always gentle with sinners. He's always gentle with those who see their sin. It's with the hardened, resistant, uh, uh, especially the hardened, resistant misinterpreters of the Old Testament that that he becomes more confrontational. Uh, but even there, the purpose is to persuade them and to challenge them, uh, not to be angry and violent towards them. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. Um, in terms of Revelation, coming back to some of the the content in the middle of the book, <laughs> we like the bookends. Um, it, it seems to me, it, it, it's showing us the antithesis between the world and the Christian, our struggle in this present age, um, but it's also showing it in terms of the the struggle with what can happen to the state. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's a, a crucial theme for the book. The state can turn, at least if you're using Revelation language, bestial, right? He mm-hmm. describes the state with sort of beastly language there. So we have the state commissioned by God um, for good, you know, but then it can turn, and, and it seems to be Revelation is showing the state in its, in its worst form uh, that can actually rise up against the church. Do you see that in the book? Yes. I think um, the one point we maybe want to discuss is the state can become beastly, but I think often the beast is not referring to the state in the book of the Revelation. I think the great chapter on 
of the state. Well, uh, in, in chapter uh, 14, mm-hmm. um, but also in chapter 17, and there the, I, I think the focus there is on the, uh, the state as the great harlot. Mm-hmm. And, um, um, that's helpful. Yeah. Uh, often in the history of interpretation, the great harlot has been seen as the false church, but I, I don't think that's correct. Uh, you know, it's the, it's the great harlot on the seven hills of Rome. Well, if, if you take one of the approaches, to, one of the historic approaches to reading the book of the Revelation, which is called the church historical approach, it sees the book of the Revelation as an unfolding of the whole history of the church. And the, that approach led people to say, well, what chapter are we in? How, mm-hmm. how far have we right. gotten in the right. history of the church? Um, almost nobody that I know of holds to that view anymore, but it was very popular at one time. And um, so I think people who held to that view would get to chapter 17, and they would see chapter 17 mm-hmm. not as about Rome um, in the first century, but as Rome ruled by the papacy, mm-hmm. you know, in right. the Middle Ages. So if you take that approach, then it makes some sense to see the false church as a great harlot. But um, I really think that's a description of the uh, of Rome in the first century and Rome as a persecutor of the church because Rome is driven by a false religion. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it is a picture of what can become of the state and um, the danger of the state becoming so allied to fort, false religion and um, mm-hmm. then descending into to horrors um, right. for the people of God. And that's when, you know, it gets challenging. You know, we, we talked about our context and what actual persecution is, but, you know, we still have a good view of government. Yeah, right. yeah. We still have Romans thirteen, right? Absolutely. Right? That's and, not thrown out. And because, First Peter yeah. two, um, right? Very important. Um, yeah, it's interesting to see how how Peter and Paul are saying the same thing. Mm-hmm.